Dragon's Dogma is a game that I love to hate and hate to love. To prepare myself for the release of Dragon's Dogma 2, I decided to check out the original and see what all the commotion was about. And let me tell ya, this game aged like a fine milk in almost every category. The open world is empty and soulless, the characters are forgettable, all the quests feel like filler, the inventory management, save system, and UI are all the worst I've ever seen in an RPG, and the story is boring as hell for the majority of the runtime. And yet, I think this game is incredible and sunk over 60 hours into it over the course of two playthroughs. How can that make sense? Dragon's Dogma is a bad game in almost every respect except the most important one. Gameplay. The combat in this game is absolutely mwah, chef's kiss. I got addicted to using high power abilities, climbing onto gigantic bosses, and experimenting with a variety of different builds. The combat and build variety in Dragon's Dogma are so amazing that literally nothing else matters. But will it click with you? In this video, we're going to do a deep dive on Dragon's Dogma so you can decide whether it's worth your time today. TLDR it is. So buckle up, grab some iced coffee, and let's dive into the world of Dragon's Dogma. The journey of any great RPG starts in character creation, and Dragon's Dogma has lots of options for customizing your protagonist's build and appearance. We're talking dozens of hairstyles, facial hair and scars, and lots of sliders to adjust all aspects of your character from head to toe. The character models look pretty outdated even for the early 2010s, but maybe I've just been spoiled by Mass Effect 2. It's certainly not as bad as Oblivion. One unique thing about the character creator is that your appearance choices are not merely cosmetic. Surprisingly, your height and weight actually have an impact on gameplay. For instance, lighter characters can dodge and climb monsters more easily, but they're also more prone to being knocked down or carried off by flying harpies. And on the flip side, taller or heavier characters are slower, but they have higher carrying capacity for inventory, and they're more resistant to getting knocked back. The game never really explains this to you though, so in hindsight, I may have reconsidered my choice to create a magic archer built like a brick shithouse. In any case, once you finish with character creation, you're dropped into the game. Your character is called the Arisen, for reasons we'll discover shortly. The game opens up with us strolling on the beach and locking eyes with the finest biddy in the village. We step two, ready to spit some game, because my guy puts the Riz in Arisen, know what I'm saying? But before we can get some action, we're unfortunately cock-blocked by an Italian dragon named Grigori, who attacks the village and tears out our heart with his toenail. All right, baby, time to kill this dragon. <laughs> we're already dead? Well, that was fast. We somehow survived the loss of our heart. How can you be so heartless? And at this point, we'll pick our starter vocation, AKA class. Our initial options are fighter, mage, and strider, which is basically a rogue, but we'll get access to six more advanced vocations a little later in the game. The real gigachad nature of this game's character building are the vocations. Dragon's Dogma has one of the most unique and awesome approaches to character classes I've ever seen in an RPG. Rather than locking you into a rigid class for the entirety of your playthrough, in Dragon's Dogma you will be leveling up a variety of classes, which you can switch between by simply visiting the innkeeper. And don't get it twisted, this is not a simple respec option. Many RPGs allow you to respec your character, but this usually involves reallocating all your skill points every time you decide to switch to a new class. When you change your vocation in Dragon's Dogma, you keep all progress you've made on other vocations. This makes it super easy to experiment with different playstyles and builds. In fact, you'll want to be switching to different vocations every time you max one out, so you can reap the benefits of passive talents from different classes and continue to build progress on your overall character. In my New Game Plus playthrough, I maxed out Mystic Knight, Magic Archer, and Sorcerer, and I plan to keep leveling Assassin and Warrior on my next playthrough that I'll be continuing into another New Game Plus run. And yes, this game has New Game Plus, so you can theoretically max out every vocation on a single character if you're willing to keep grinding and building over multiple playthroughs. My only complaint about the vocations in Dragon's Dogma is that the early stages of progression feel pretty bad. Most builds feel incredibly underpowered and then suddenly pop off at later levels rather than gradually getting stronger. 
Sorcerer is a great example. Playing Sork feels like complete dog shit until you unlock Maelstrom and that big ass Comet spell. And then all of a sudden your character becomes a god, AoE wiping out entire battlefields with a single cast. Magic Archer had a similar progression for me, so the fun factor for most classes in the game looks like this. It doesn't help that all the best gear in the game is locked behind beating the final boss or farming in the DLC, which is difficult to do for lower level characters or people who are new to the game. Seriously, the dragon gear that drops from the final boss is at least twice as powerful as anything you unlock in the base game. So the overall progression of your character feels incredibly uneven. The combat in this game took me a while to get used to, but once everything finally clicked, I quickly became addicted. It feels incredible to take down a giant boss or wipe out a mob with a powerful ricochet electrical attack. You start your journey incredibly weak and with scuffed, cobbled together gear, but you eventually ascend to godhood with pretty much every class in the game. The different vocations all offer widely different playstyles, which increases replayability. Mystic Knights can leap high into the air to take down flying harpies and succubi. Sorcerers can cast gigantic tornadoes to suck up all the enemies and shred boss health bars. Magic Archers can unleash a stream of magical bolts that ricochet off walls dealing damage to all enemies caught in their path. And these examples only scratch the surface of what you can do in Dragon's Dogma. One thing I found interesting with the combat was the insanely long casting times for high level abilities. For instance, casting high Maelstrom as a sorcerer can take five to 10 seconds. So you really need to pay attention to positioning to make sure you'll hit your intended target and not get smacked in the face before unleashing your OP tornado spell. But the biggest claim to fame of Dragon's Dogma's combat is that you can climb onto and attack giant boss monsters. If the fire giant from Elden Ring were in this game, you wouldn't be relegated to just smacking his ankles with a sharp stick. No, you could actually climb that mofo and stab him in the eye until he either died or tossed you off. The dagger-wielding classes like Assassin, Magic Archer, Strider, and Ranger are best suited to climbing combat since they can attack much faster while clinging to a monster. But you can still pull off similar attacks with the other vocations to lesser effect. You'll get the opportunity to fell all sorts of beasts such as griffins, hydra, dragons, trolls, ogres, golems, chimeras, and more. Other mobs and basic enemies don't pose much of a challenge unless you're incredibly underleveled, but they still are fun target practice for your abilities. The only aspect of combat I didn't care for, and it's only tangentially related, is the inventory management system. There are no hotkeys for consumable items, so every time you need to heal or use an item to remove a debuff, you need to open up a menu, which completely pauses combat, and sort through a shit ton of items to find what you're looking for. And you will be doing this a lot, mainly to replenish your stamina, because you'll be running out of stamina constantly unless you're mainly using basic attacks. Dragon's Dogma has one of the worst inventory systems I've seen in an RPG recently. And given the fact that your carry weight impacts mobility, you will be constantly shifting items to companions or your storage at the end to ensure you're not fat rolling your way through tough enemy encounters. If you do a 50 hour playthrough of Dragon's Dogma, five hours of that will be spent shuffling through inventory and menus. Okay, I'm exaggerating a bit, but only slightly. But combat in Dragon's Dogma is not inherently a solo venture. You can have up to three companions at a time to help you conquer your foes. As we're leaving the village for the first time, we're introduced to our first companion, Rook, who drops out of the sky and flashes us a gang sign. Now, don't get it twisted. If you're expecting a Baldur's Gate 3 style journey filled with companions with deep backstories, romance, and friendship, you're gonna be deeply disappointed. Despite his flashy introduction, this character and all companions in Dragon's Dogma are completely disposable and offer no personality or narrative value on their own. The companions in Dragon's Dogma are called pawns, and from a lore standpoint, they are literally shallow, inhuman husks that lack any inner drive or motivation, and they require direction from a character like yours to serve any kind of function in the world. Early in the game, you will custom create your own pawn, and you can recruit two more pawns to fill out a max party size of four. The main interesting thing about the pawns is that the ones you recruit are created by other players. 
and other players will recruit your pawn into their party in their own games. My favorite pawn recruit had to be Goth GF, a mage healer that carried me through the early and mid game. Your main pawn will level up with you, but the other ones will always stay at their current level, so you'll need to swap them out for higher level ones as you progress through the story. But are the pawns actually useful in combat? <laughs> okay, the pawns are, how do I describe them? They're retarded. Pawns are pretty much useless in combat. Their AI is woefully inadequate, and your options for giving them direction are incredibly limited. You've got three command buttons, go, follow, and help, the last of which is basically a request for healing or revival. You can set your main pawn's combat style by talking to them at the quote-unquote knowledge chair, where you'll basically set how aggressive they will be in battle. One of the most frustrating things I've noticed is that pawns will sometimes completely disengage from combat mid-fight, walking around an active battlefield doing absolutely f all. Even hitting the go command won't necessarily coax your pawns back into the fight. Yo, when I told you to hang back in a fight, I didn't mean stop fighting completely, you dumb bitch. Most of the time, this doesn't matter because you can just take out all the enemies yourself, but if you're unlucky enough to run into an enemy that's completely resistant to the type of damage your main character deals, then you're gonna have a very, very bad time. Sometimes I wish I could just manually swap to my companion characters like Dragon Age and get them to do the things I need from them. Because as it stands, the best you can hope for from the pawns is that they draw some aggro and maybe do a bit of spot healing or elemental buffs to your main character. Other than that, they're pretty much useless. Maybe not entirely useless, pawns will often shout out tips for quests and combat, which can be helpful for revealing enemy weaknesses. But hilariously, they won't follow their own advice in combat. For instance, my pawns were shouting at me to destroy the weak points on a metal golem, but they refused to strike those weak points themselves. And considering the golem had like 99% resistance to magical attacks, this fight took me a very long time with my sorcerer character. I really hope Capcom will revamp the pawns for Dragon's Dogma 2 and either improve the AI or give the player more control over how the pawns act. Because the way they function in the original game just ain't it, bro. Dragon's Dogma is an open world RPG, but unfortunately exploration is one of the weakest aspects of the game. The overworld map is pretty empty and uninteresting to explore for the most part. You pretty much only find enemy mobs, crafting materials, and the occasional item. And because fast travel was implemented in the most horrendously terrible way possible, you probably won't want to explore very much unless it's required to progress the story. Here's how fast travel works in Dragon's Dogma. First, you need to obtain a consumable item called a Fairy Stone. These are single-use items, but thankfully there is an eternal Fairy Stone you can pull from your inventory in the Dark Arisen edition of the game. Using this will allow you to travel to select locations on the map. The only default locations available to you are the starting town of Casardis and the main hub of Grand Soren. You can also fast travel to locations where you have placed a port crystal, but these items are exceedingly rare. You can only get like four or five of them per playthrough, which isn't enough to cover all the far reaches of the map. So even with strategically placed port crystals at all the high traffic locations in the world, you'll still spend a ton of time traveling by foot through an empty open world with nothing to do but fight mobs. And as fun as the combat is in Dragon's Dogma, taking out random mobs of bandits, goblins, and harpies just ain't as enjoyable when you're 30 hours into the game. Thankfully, your port crystals do carry over into New Game Plus, so you reobtain and expand your overall number of fast travel hubs with each playthrough, but getting around the map is more of a boring pain in the ass than it needs to be in Dragon's Dogma, which is something I hope they rectify in the sequel. So let's talk about the quest content in Dragon's Dogma. Without getting into spoiler territory, the main quest is basically, we must kill this dragon. There's a little bit more to it, especially towards the ending and post game, but that is the gist of it. Most quests in this game are simple fetch and kill quests with very little depth. There are a handful of memorable NPCs like the big titty blonde merchant, the bald landlord, and the crazy witch lady. 
But most of your quest objectives are go here, kill this, or loot this, report back and collect a reward. The notice board quests are by far the worst defender here and feel like they were straight ripped from an MMO. Kill 50 bandits, loot 50 skulls, escort an NPC to the waterfall, etc. Occasionally you will get some choices in the main story and side quests, and I'd be lying if I said there were no memorable quests in this game, but some of the most hilarious moments happen when the game doesn't give you a choice. For instance, there's a quest line involving a goth witch lady named Celine. She discovers that she is actually a pawn with no drive of her own, but she desperately wants to know what it feels like to be human. And to achieve this goal, the crazy bitch just moves into your house uninvited, and you don't even get the option to say no. Now I can live together with you as a fellow man, an equal. Hey, if you really want to learn what it means to be human, how about getting a job and paying rent? No free lunches in my shack, lady. Dragon's Dogma also has romance, sort of, but it's jank as fuck. All NPCs in the game have approval ratings based on the things you say and do to them. The game will track this and then automatically assign one of the highest rated NPCs as your quote unquote beloved, which will essentially be treated as the protagonist's love interest during cutscenes near the end of the game and in the epilogue. But you do not manually choose who your beloved is. You can influence the eventual outcome by giving gifts and completing quests, but at the end of the day, it's not an actual choice like you would get in other RPGs. Before we wrap up, I just want to briefly touch on the endgame gameplay loop and the DLC zone Bitter Black Isle. This is one of the few single player RPGs I've played that really feels like it has meaningful endgame and new game plus progression loop. As I mentioned earlier, the most powerful gear in the game will all be found either by defeating the final boss, in the post game, or on Bitter Black Isle. So if you really want to see the most powerful form of your build, this is the time when that build comes together. And as I mentioned earlier, you can continue leveling up different vocations, trying new builds, and gearing them out. Plus, the enemies you face on Bitter Black Isle in particular are much stronger than anything in the base game. So if you enjoy the combat, there are still goals to grind towards in the end game or new game plus. After finishing the main campaign and post game, I dove straight into a new game plus playthrough, mainly so I could complete some of the side quests I missed in my first playthrough, and to test out more vocations I didn't experiment with the first time around. Dragon's Dogma is a game like no other. And despite all its flaws, I'd highly recommend it to any enjoyers of RPGs, action games, or fantasy games. I'm excited to see what Capcom does with Dragon's Dogma 2. I think if they can deliver the same kind of combat experience and then just slightly improve the clunky UI and lackluster open world and quest content, they could have a real gem on their hands. Dragon's Dogma Dark Arisen, which includes the DLC and some bonus items, is $39.99 full price, but you can usually snag it on sale for as little as $5. And it's definitely well worth the money if you're interested in checking it out. So there you have it. OG Dragon's Dogma is still worth playing today. And if you're interested in playing it yourself, be sure to keep an eye out for some beginner guides that I'll be posting in the coming days. I'll put links to those in the pinned comment on this video when they are live. And you can also subscribe to Big Dan Gaming and hit the notification icon to be notified whenever I post a new video. Big shout out to all the channel members for supporting my content. Until next time, this has been Big Dan. I should go.